Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this last uh, session of the weekly series organized by the London Middle East Institute. Our director, uh, Dr. Hassan Hakimian, is there, and we, we, he's always uh, offering us spaces to, to talk about very important issues. Um, I'm, it's the last one for this term, and uh, we will start the series again in the next uh, academic year. Uh, I'm Dina Matar. I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies, and uh, I also work at SOAS, and I'm a, a you know, kind of a media scholar, so to speak. Um, I'm really very, very delighted to be chairing this session where we have, you know, two outstanding colleagues, uh, scholars, activists, uh, you name it, who have been working diligently to try and um, improve and open up our understanding of Palestine and Israel and the relationship between them. Um, so we have uh, Professor Ronit Lenton, um, who, whose book, Traces of Racial Exception, Racializing uh, Israeli Settler Colonialism, is the subject of this discussion tonight. Um, and there are copies of the book outside. Um, and we are really looking forward to hearing uh, what she has to say around this topic. She was the former director of the Ethnic and Racial uh, Studies at Trinity College uh, Dublin. She is retired, but still working really hard, as you can see. Um, she has written extensively. Uh, so, some of her books, I'll just mention a few. Uh, they include Conversations with Palestinian Women, which was published in 1982, Israel and the Daughters of the Shoah, Reoccupying the Territories of Silence, 2000. Um, she is also the editor of Gender and Catastrophe, um, and then she has uh, written on uh, several topics related to uh, gender and genocide, gender and the Holocaust, Israeli and Palestinian peace activism, and racism in Ireland. Um, and I think she will probably, I don't want to take too much time explaining, but uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you know her and know of her work. Uh, but we are really looking forward to how she's going to talk about uh, the book and the question of racial exception, which is very pertinent this time, you know, considering uh, the latest Israeli um, uh, kind of uh, statement regarding Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and Professor Chaim Bershid, uh, Bershid I, al I never pronounced your name properly, so excuse me. I did? Okay. He is a colleague and, um, again, a, an activist, a filmmaker, photographer, and a film studies scholar. But I can say he also wears many hats. He's, you know, kind of historian, uh, critical scholar, uh, everything put together. He has been, uh, he has retired from the University of, Lo of East London, where he worked uh, since early 2002. And he has been um, an associate, and he has taught with us here at SOAS, and he is an associate member of the Center for Palestine Studies. He has um, published widely. Uh, his books include the best-selling Introduction to the Holocaust, um, and the first version was titled Holocaust for Beginners. He also edited volumes uh, including The Gulf War and the New World Order with Nira Ural uh, Davis, published in 1992. He has co-edited a volume with Haifa Hamami, The Conflict and Contemporary Visual Culture in Palestine and Israel, a special double issue, and a special double issue on third text on Palestinian and Israeli art, literature, architecture, and cinema. And he is on the editorial board of several publications, in, including, are you on the editorial board of Journal of Holy Land? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, so, so many editorial boards he's serving on, he cannot remember. But I'm really delighted because what we're going to do here is, um, I think, Chaim is going to start and then Ronit will talk. That's the order of the day, isn't it? And then we will have, open up the discussion, uh, you know, as a conversation with you. So, you know, in a sense, what I would like is not long statements and uh, kind of uh, points, but it's a kind of conversation so we can come out with, with a better understanding of why we are talking of the, of the topic of racial exception at this time um, and thinking about racializing Israeli settler colonialism. So without further ado, may I uh, 
may you join me in welcoming our speakers. And I'll, you know, I'm sure you keep with the time, so. Thank you very much, Dina and uh, Hassan and everyone. And um, I'm very honored to um, speak about this book. Um, I think it's quite um, a special um, volume. And uh, I'm speaking about it with some trepidation because it is a very dense volume. It's, you have to read every word. And believe me, you will read every word of this book. And starting with the preface, which is uh, a masterpiece, uh, please don't forget to read the preface. <laughs> Um, and, every, and you will say this to everyone else when you uh, speak to them, I'm sure. Now, what this book is doing is something which is very important and, and timely. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And I'm quite, um, I quite admire the work that went into it. It was very ardent mapping of the debates and theoretical uh, approaches that were taken to the Israel-Palestine situation. I don't want to call it conflict because uh, you know the reasons, yeah? So um, what I think um, has happened over the last two decades, at least, is um, a lot of Israeli and other, uh, including Palestinian um, uh, academics, um, trying to find um, a theoretical framework to analyze and understand Israel. Now, Israel as a settler colonial state is not um, so usual, yeah? Uh, not that there is a typical uh, settler colonial state. A lot of people have made that point, especially Patrick Wolf. Um, but uh, a lot of the Israeli discussion, which I will get to in a minute, is using terminology which is problematic. So I think what um, this book is doing, and I very much welcome it, is trying to map the debate until now, um, the terminologies, the problematic of the different terminologies, and trying to find, and I think finding, um, a way of putting together a number of approaches to uh, concoct quite um, an accurate and uh, timely way of looking at Israel. And Ronit says in the book quite clearly that she's not discussing Palestine. Of course, she's discussing the Palestinians all the time. But she's not discussing Palestine. She is discussing Israel as um, an anti-Zionist Israeli living in Ireland. Now, uh, the argument is based on study and following of a number of theorists. So I'll very briefly go through it because I think it's important. Um, they include uh, Lorenzo Veracini, which I'm sure people here know, um, um, settler colonial present. Um, they include Agamben, now, when it comes to Agamben, Ronit uh, is being very careful to point out uh, the problematic of using Agamben and his limitations, um, his, uh, if you want, Eurocentrism, and the fact that he does not relate to the colonial aspects of um, um, <coughs> situations that he's discussing, and he's discussing mainly European situations. Um, even in his later work. And so, uh, while Agamben is very difficult not to relate to in this debate, she is actually qualifying this um, by using others, by adding to this amalgam of theoretical approaches, others who do. Um, the main one, I think, is Patrick Wolf, uh, Traces of... Um, um, history, um, and I think the book, of course, is um, the, the book title, I assume, is related to, to his title. And um, he combines <coughs> a number of approaches uh, that are useful for Ronit. 
and are useful for discussing Israel. And these are both um, racism and settler colonialism, which of course has been uh, very important in, in the last few decades. So by adding um, Patrick Wolfe and his um, very different way of looking at um, Israel, and of course Agamben is not writing about Israel, but he's writing about the state of exception, and the state of exception is very important for discussing Israel. Um, he, I think what Ronit is doing is actually um, creating, um, uh, if you wish, a theoretical space which is not based on one position only and, or, and the limitations of, of such a position, but actually combining those to create a safer theoretical space. Now, she also used uh, Foucault, um, and Foucault is also problematic for different but similar reasons um, that I've mentioned about Agamben. And uh, when um, discussing concepts like Burr life, um, which I will mention also in a minute, um, there are problems which um, Foucault is not actually able to, to resolve, or let's say a use of Foucault will not resolve, rather. And she's using David T. Goldberg on racial Palestinization. Um, this is very useful in the book because this informs uh, very much the position that she then takes. Uh, now, of course, one has to say, I know it, it should be obvious, but I, I want to say it, that Ronit is not treating race as a biological concept or system, but as a cultural construct, which is uh, basically used in order to racialize communities and exploit them or expel them or both of those. So please don't be confused by the term um, racial traces before you read the book. Um, I think she talks a lot about the to technologies of racialization. Um, I think all of us who are connected in any way to um, what is happening uh, know those technologies. And um, those technologies include most of the ways that life is experienced in Palestine. Um, they include um, disconnecting from services. Um, I don't need to tell you about that. You see it on the television screens. Um, not allowing connection to services where they exist, for example. Um, Israel has um, torn up the whole telephone system of Palestine in 2002. Um, of course, um, this was already in the at, the, at the point in time that um, mobile telephones existed. But the mobile telephone system of Palestine is also controlled by Israel indirectly. Um, the internet is controlled by Israel. So actually, any connection of very isolated communities like Gaza, but also uh, people in the West Bank, and to a degree, Israeli citizen, uh, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, are actually controlled by racialized technologies. Um, the uh, removal of the right to, re to uh, elect and be elected to represent your community is now well advanced. Uh, you would know that um, only by, at the moment it seems that the Supreme Court has thrown out the, um, uh, you know, the approach to um, deny uh, some of the Palestinian members of the Knesset uh, the right to stand for election. While it didn't deny, uh, they didn't actually do anything illegal, of course. Uh, it didn't deny the same right to uh, fascist Jewish um, 
um, legislators who have broken the law and continue to break the law and are actually asking for expuls expulsion and genocide. So uh, this is uh, another technology of um, racialization of the, um, the Palestinians. Um, the simple issue of building permissions, for example. Um, most of the Palestinians living in Israel are unable to build for their children or for themselves. Um, towns, maybe cities I should call them, Ramle or Lidda, are actually choked. And Palestinians cannot, uh, because uh, those um, permissions are not processed by the local authorities. I'm not even talking about uh, the uh, sea areas in Palestine where, of course, uh, only um, settlers can build. Um, annulling the right, um, annulling all rights of citizenship, free movement, the right to education, the right to, um, um, to, uh, uh, to have a job for employment, um, the right to actually uh, have pr private property, um, the right for legal um, support. So uh, basically, uh, all rights which are normalized in Israel are denied in Palestine. And I, 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 w I could continue, but you, I think, are getting uh, this point. Um, when it comes to Gaza, it's a denial of life. So here, the argument about uh, stat uh, state of uh, exception and uh, Foucault's um, typification of uh, those who are destined to live and those who are destined to die, um, the whole community of Gaza is basically destined to die. They have no right to, to life and they have no right to what it means to be living. So this is a range of those technologies of exception and racialization, which are used to impose um, the control through race. Now, um, I'm coming to a point that I mentioned, and that is in the debate that Israelis have had, and actually one of them is going to be here tomorrow, uh, Oren Iftachel, which is discussed uh, in the book uh, quite a lot. Um, Israelis used um, the concept and term of ethnicity quite a lot. I think what uh, is argued in the book that um, this is um, very, very suspect, to say the least. Um, of course, you would know, I'm sure, that the framework, the theoretical framework that you choose dictates your conclusions in a great way. Uh, it, it kind of limits and delimits any conclusions that you can come up with and by the time that you have chosen, or you have chosen ethnocracy and ethnic as uh, your key concept, you've actually uh, made sure that racism is not discussed. And I think that is the function of the use of ethnocracy and ethnicity. And um, there's a number of people who have um, used that over the last 20 years, um, or in Iftachel, is talking about an ethnocracy. Israel is an ethnocracy. Uh, Sami Smocha calls it ethnic democracy. And even Ilan Pape used the concept ethnic cleansing. I want to actually separate the first two from Ilan uh, for very good reasons. Uh, but um, the first two, by using those concepts, are avoiding racism altogether. Also, by using ethnicity, the assumption is that Jews are of uh, an ethnicity. I think uh, we already have quite a lot of people, especially Shlomo Zand, who've proven, I think, beyond any reasonable doubt that the Jews are neither a nation nor an ethnicity. And therefore, by using ethnicity, you are, uh, you know, it's a double crime. It's hiding the racial and racialization aspects uh, but also making uh, Israel, as a, uh, uh, presenting Israel as a race, as an um, um, ethnic continuity, which it is not. And of course, racism in Israel is not limited to the Palestinians. 
it is actually rampant against black Jews, against the Mizrahis, etc. So actually, <coughs> by talking about an ethnicity, you are actually making um, something very seriously wrong. Um, the uh, argument against um, Ilan's title, I think, is very interesting and correct. And that is that this is a term coined by Milosevic in order to actually give genocide a, a good press. Yeah? This is what they were doing. They were actually committing genocide in um, ex-Yugoslavia. And by calling it ethnic cleansing, I mean, just think about the concept, cleansing. This is, this, this is something clean, you know? They are just cleaning um, Yugoslavia or cleaning Serbia. So the idea of uh, this, um, you know, cleansing is actually um, both um, a regime um, or a state terminology using a terminology of a fascist like Milosevic um, without um, too many qualifications, one has to say. Um, so maybe if Ilan, who is a friend of all of us, and who, you know, we, we very much support what he's writing. Uh, if he was calling his book um, about ethnic cleansing in Palestine, genocide in Palestine, uh, the book may not have been published. We know uh, the, the kind of frantic atmosphere at the moment, yeah? But it would be more accurate. Uh, so the idea of using ethnic, I think, is um, very suspect, and Ronit is avoiding doing that at all cost, um, and discusses the terms that do that. Now, uh, the book is divided basically into six chapters, and I've more or less done what the first chapter is doing. Uh, have I got another five minutes? Yes. Um, the four chapters I will just go through in five minutes because they're very important, the structure, um, be especially because uh, I think the book is doing things that other people have not done. Um, the first one is probably the one that is being dealt with by other people, and that is um, the rule of law as a, a racializing system. Um, and, you know, I don't have time to speak about this, but we all know that Israel has got over 60 laws um, who racialize the Palestinians as victims through different, um, you know, making, um, in a sense, making them into the homo sucker of Palestine so that um, they are in the position of what Agamben calls bare life. Now, Onit is actually not happy with the concept of bare life because uh, if one uses it on Palestine, that is removing agency from the Palestinians. Um, I want to present to Ronit with one question, and that is, I think that uh, living in Gaza is probably, unfortunately, the best example today of bare life. Um, and yet, of course, we know that there is resistance and very strong resistance in Gaza. So agency is not removed. But the question is, what is the relationship between uh, resistance to bare life and the actual situation of bare life? And I, I hope you can relate to that. Because sometimes, uh, of course, the Gazans spare, uh, face a situation where the more resistance they are actually using, the less life is spent, the less life is left in, in, in Gaza in, in, in look, by looking at it uh, through a gun bin. The um, second, the third um, chapter deals with uh, Israel as a racialized um, settler colonial state. Now, uh, people have dealt, have dealt with Israel as a settler colonial state. Um, the first one is, of course, Maxime Rodanson in 67. So there's a, a long history of um, understanding, theoretically, Israel as a settler colonial state. But uh, Rodanson, for example, doesn't relate to race. So I think uh, 
this was started mainly by people like Patrick Wolf, and I think when it really develops what Wolf, um, of course, doesn't do because he's only talking about it in one chapter in his book, and this whole book is dealing with the racialized state. Um, and the connections, the historical connections, not just in Israel, but in other settler colonial situations between uh, race and the procedures of um, a state of exception and bare life. Um, the fourth chapter is a critique of um, the Eurocentrism of Agamben and other theoreticians which I think she uses marvelously, uh, but of course always in a qualified manner. Um, it would be wrong not to use what is very useful in Agamben or in Foucault. So um, the book does that, but always you know where you are in terms of their overall positions. Um, uh, she uses what's useful and she um, basically leaves alone uh, what is highly suspect or um, inaccurate today, and we can see that. And five, uh, uh, chapter 5 is very interesting, and I, I probably have to end on this, and that is the gender elements of the conflict of racializing Palestine. <coughs> now, a number of uh, Palestinian women, and very few Israeli women, I have written about this recently. Um, you know, more, most importantly, uh, Nadra Shalhub Kevorkian, for example. And uh, they are speaking about the racialization of uh, the Palestinian, and not just of the Palestinian woman, but of course for, about concepts like feminizing the Palestinian male. That's a very important part of um, destroying Palestine. So um, basically, uh, she starts from the obvious uh, using rape as a weapon of war in 1948, for example, uh, a subject that was very um, much silenced, even by those who uh, first presented it, like Benny Morris, um, who discusses it as an exception. Um, though at the same time he says it happened a lot, but he discusses it as exceptions. But Benny Morris was the first one to, to tell us that all those cases of rapes were silenced. Uh, people have been, uh, through a procedure, a kind of court martial when um, they were um, exposed, but um, they actually, um, you know, the, the cases were totally silenced because it was bad news for Zionism in Israel. So this is part of the toolbox, and this is the most horrific tool in that toolbox. But there are other um, parts uh, of that toolbox which um, one needs to think about. And of course, the feminization of Palestinians is related in Ronit's um, analysis to the masculinization of the Zionist male. In other words, these are the polarities of the racialization process, using gender to create um, the uh, Palestinian male who is less m masculine or feminized, and the Israeli male who is a superman of uh, masculinity. Um, this is very interesting when you think that the main task of the IDF and of the Israeli male is fighting little boys and old men and women who are unarmed when Israel has the most advanced arms on this planet. Um, and basically, th these are the supermen. They are fighting, you know, totally um, unarmed and peaceful civilians, and this is um, what they present themselves as. And, um, of course, um, the cases of, r yeah, at one minute? Yeah, just one minute. Um, an important part of the, f the feminization of Palestine is the use of uh, rape, for example, to cause uh, 
um, you know, um, expulsions and uh, you know, mass um, uh, mass expulsions, uh, like in the case of, of course, the famous um, um, cases of uh, massacre, where you know some of the uh, communications that were received by the Palestinians is, if you don't leave, we will uh, rape all the women. Uh, so the few cases that were known about were enough to prove to Palestinians that this is what is awaiting them elsewhere. So I want to finish by saying that I think that what the book is doing is um, a very timely putting together of the problematic methods that were used over many decades to discuss Palestine and suggesting a framework which is actually uh, much more fitting, more accurate and less <coughs> problematic and more in line especially with uh, black theoreticians writing about race and settler colonialism, uh, for example, in the two Americas and in Africa. So she's actually modernizing uh, the language, uh, the theoretical framework, the methods, and the sources, um, and builds uh, a new progressive toolkit for us to discuss Palestine. Thank you. Well, for that, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, SOAS and the Center for uh, uh, Palestine Studies and its chair, uh, Professor Matar, and Vincenzo Paci, who done all the organizing for hosting this talk, and of course to Haim, who took time for me, busy schedule finishing his book to launch the book. Um, I'm also indebted to the Paris-born Palestinian artist Hani Zuro, who um, allowed us to use his uh, picture painting a low quality love for the cover. And I'm delighted to see my son Mickey, who took some time off his busy schedule to attend here. Great to see you here, Mick. Um, Chaim has put me, gave, given me some challenges. He told me about it before, but my talk was written already. So I'll try and kind of extemporize and reply to some of the things. But I'd like to say, first of all, a lot has changed since I finished this book and since the book has been published. Because you know, um, things change every minute in, in Israel and Palestine, and it's very hard to put a full stop, but put a full stop, you must. So, um, just a few things that happened since the book was finished. First of all, the um, ongoing wanton massacre of unarmed protesters at the Gaza a border fence, which had gone on for almost, um, almost a year now, leading, according to uh, the recent sources I have, to 265 people uh, murdered, including um, 41 children, two journalists, three paramedics, and I know the, the figures have, been, have, have increased since, and injuring almost 15,000 people, some of whom maimed for life. Then there's the ongoing uh, threat of demolishing the so-called unrecognized Bedouin village of um, uh, Khan al-Ahmar, which has been defied, uh, deferred for the time being, but still it's pending. And in fact, in January, the uh, Minister for Agriculture, Uri Ariel, has announced a plan to expel 36,000 Bedouins, Palestinians, from their so-called unrecognized villages to make room for so-called national projects, including Trans-Israel Highway. Because Bedouin, you see, are at the bottom of the racial hierarchy in um, colonial Israel. There's been also some minor events, minor but very famous, the arrest and the release of the uh, heroic um, teenager Ay Tamimi, and the arrest and final release of the poet Darin Tatur for a poem that she uh, called Resist My People, Resist Them, which was, she published on Facebook. And above all, the passage of the racist um, uh, nation state bill last year by the Israeli Knesset, of which more later. And at the moment, the racist competition between candidates for elections about <laughs> how many people, uh, Palestinians, they will kill and how many refugees they will expel. So what I want to do in this talk is, first of all, explain why I chose race as my, my framework. And um, I call it Israel's permanent war against pa the Palestinians. I don't call it the conflict, because it's not conflict, it's colonization. And colonization, to understand colonization, you absolutely need the lens of race. As Patrick Wolfe, 
um, said racist colonialism speaking in idioms whose diverse diversity reflects a variety of unequal relationships into which Europeans have co-opted conquered populations. I also don't call it um, uh, Israel stroke Palestine or Palestine stroke Israel because such coupling always hides unequal power. So here goes. In March 2016, the IDF medic El Or Azaria shot to death Abdel Fattah El Sharif and unarmed Palestinians minutes after the short soldiers have been shot, wounded, and so called neutralized him for attempting to stab an Israeli soldier while he was lying on the ground unable to move. Azaria was charged with murder, later it was commuted to manslaughter. Al Sharif was one of 181 Palestinians, so called terror subject, suspects, who were extrajudicially executed by Israel's security forces between October 2016 and March 2016. Six months, 181 Palestinians were killed. The killing was supported by 65% of the Israeli uh, Jewish population in a poll and 67%. Uh, supported pardoning Azaria, who was also supported by Netanyahu, Lieberman, and various other politicians. And also by southern Israeli demonstrators who, in the demonstrations, shouted death to the Arabs. Azaria is far from unique. Of 186 IDF criminal investigations in 2015, only four ended in indictments. <coughs> he was only tried because it was filmed by a Palestinian cameraman who received many death threats when the video went viral. He got a lenient sentence of 18 months, third half of it, and then uh, when he was released, he became a national hero and became the man of the year in the year he was released. But as Neil Gordon writes, Azaria is no way an aberration of Israel colonial project, but rather a clear symptom of its very structure. But what I'd like to say to you here that Azaria, the case illustrates the centrality of race to Israel's permanent war against Palestine. First, the ease with which a Jewish soldier can extrajudicially execute an unarmed, helpless Palestinian, illustrate the racialization and dehumanization of Palestinians by Israeli Jews, whose white Jewish supremacy parallels the sense of victimhood, and let's talk about this later. Second, Azaria is an Arab or Mizrahi Jew, and that demonstrates the racialization of Arab Jews in Israel's complex racial reality. According to Yudha Shenhav, an Israeli sociologist, Azaria's trial would, not, would have gone differently had he been Ashkenazi. He writes, the Mizrahi is not one of us. We are more, more moral, better. The trial expresses superiority disguised as morality. Third, Azaria's conviction heightens Israeli's sense of victimhood, the, one, the other side of the colonial race coin. Colonizers on the one hand, eternal victims on the other which is a lethal cocktail. Now, I, I, as Haim su um, suggested, I engage three um, pronged um, theories to uh, look at Israel ru ruled over Palestine. First, as a state of exception. Second, as a racial state. And third, as a settler colony. Because very few writers about Israel privileged race, which is my main objective, therefore, was to close the gap and position race front and center. Following the race theorist Alexander Wehlie, I understand race not as biological or cultural, but rather the socio-political process of differentiation, which are projected onto the biological body and as presenting visual modalities in which dehumanization and classifications are lived. He argues that humans create race for the benefit of some and detriment of others. And ultimately, race was created to sustain white supremacy and hegemony and differentiate between what he calls humans, not quite humans, <coughs> and non-humans. In my previous work, I focused, as Haim said, uh, on Israel as a classic case of what Agamben calls the state of exception. Israel ruled Palestine through a practice of, exce practice of exception permanent emergency and the whole plethora of emergency laws, necessity and security. And its self-styled exceptionalism positioned it outside and above international and domestic law regarding Palestinian citizens, occupied, besieged, refugee and diasporan subjects. 
Palestinians are categorized into citizens, otherwise known as 48 Palestinians, occupied and besieged subjects, otherwise known as 67 Palestinians, and refugees. They are controlled through various technologies of segregation, exclusion, and surveillance, which have been employed since. No? Could you yeah. put it Thank you. Sorry. Great. Very sorry. These were employed since the 1948 Plan D for the elimination of the Palestinians to present policies of occupation, siege, and prevention of the return of refugees. But as Heim said, I criticize the government for his Eurocentrism. Uh, and he's been critiqued for not taking on both colonialism and decolonization and occluding race. And it's interesting because the concept of bare life that Heim mentioned is useful to understand the position of Palestinian subjects. But it's interesting too that the whole, um, the, Agamben started this looking at bare life from the uh, Nazi concentration camps. He called the ultimate bare life the Muslim men, the people who reached the bottom of the heap. And, but they were called Muslim men by the Nazis because they actually crouched on the floor like in Muslim prayer. And this was a usually racialized concept. And nobody really given, has given much, much uh, attention to the, the, the concept of Muslim men. Now the Muslim men themselves could have seen as people without agency. But in fact, Agamben finishes his book on uh, Homo Sacer with a chapter on the writings by former Muslim men. Some of them have managed to survive. <coughs> and in fact, even they had some degree of agency. So when we look at bare life, and when we look at zones of exception, we have to remember that we're not talking about people without agency. And I kind of prefer to Agamben zones of exception um, to, um, to um, I prefer his zone of exception, not to use his zone of exception, in favor of Fanon's idea of zones and zones of non-being, and um, Jasper Poir's a uh, concept of slow death. And if you look at Gaza, as I mentioned, and I'm not kind of going to talk much about Gaza, um, you basically look at a population that's at the mercy of a zone of non-being, and living, in a way, a slow death. But yet, despite all this, having huge agency, and I applaud the constant insistence on staging, particularly the march for return. So another reason for using race is, as I mentioned, is the tendency to theorize Israel in terms of ethnicity. But I won't kind of say what he said, but I'll just say that Looking at ethnicity, at, at, at Israelis as ethnically homogeneous, actually completely obscures the real heterogeneity. And uh, David Goldberg calls this homogeneity, heterogeneity in denial, if you think of it. This homogeneity is really a fiction. In view of the uh, erroneous claim that we are all post-racial now, the race scholar Barna Hesse argues that even racism, the concept of racism was conceived without the implications of race. In fact, it is a Eurocentric ideology. He questions how the racialized experiences and violations of the Jews in Europe, rather than those associated with US blacks and colonized non-whites generally, came to dominate the 20th century concept of racism in international relations and in international scholarship. It's therefore highly a hardly surprising in Israel, which is avowedly um, establishes a safe haven for the descendants of Jewish victims of historical racialization, culminating in the Nazi genocide, using the term race is frowned upon. The reluctance to name race means that while decrying Nazi and other non-Jewish racism against Jews, Israel is blithely racist against its colonized subjects in the name of white Eurocentrism that doesn't speak its name. This is despite Zionism racialization of Palestinians, of Mizrahi, Arab Jews, black Ethiopian Jews, and of non-Jewish, non-white migrants and refugees, which makes Israel a classic, what David Theo Goldberg calls, racial state. Now the racial state, as he argues, exclude and include in racial terms in order to construct homogeneity 
through very ordinary things, governmental technologies, border controls, immigration policies, military and police forces, citizenship regimes, surveillance strategies, and census categorization, but also invented histories and traditions that construct state narrative, state memory, and state history, and also the evocation of ancient roots. And this is something Zionist Jews use constantly. We were here before. Talk about the patriarchs, the biblical roots. And this has been deconstructed many times by various scholars. He also argues that the law actually works in the service of the racial state rather than construct um, checks and balances. I don't know if anybody saw on Facebook the recent uh, a little um, a video of Ayala Chaked, the current uh, Minister for Justice, who is publicizing a new perfume called Fascism, which to her... <laughs> no? It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that. So, <laughs> yes. To her, fascism smells like democracy, but she says, but she talks about demolishing the, the, the court system, demolishing the justice system, which is to her a, a great aim. But the laws, as Chaim mentioned, there are about 50 laws, uh, which are racist laws, and they include the 1950 law of return, according to which everyone who has a Jewish mother, even those who don't have Jewish mothers, often, uh, can get automatic Israeli citizenship. The 1950 citizenship law that deprives Palestinian born on the land um, of citizenship. The 1950 absentee's property law, that grants the state ownership of the property of Palestinians expropriated in 1948, who were dubbed present absentees. And of course, the 2018 nation state bill that enshrines Israel racial regime in law. Gideon Levy of Haaretz writes so about it. The Jerusalem District Court ruled that a Jew who was injured in a terrorist attack is entitled to additional compensation because he is a Jew without proof of any damage, based on the nation state law, which states that the government will strive to protect the well-being of Jews. The circle has been closed, he writes. Now it is a real race law. From now on, two types of blood exist in Israel, Jewish blood and non-Jewish blood, in the law books as well as in, in life. The price of these two types of blood is also different. Jewish blood is priceless. It must be protected in every possible way. Non-Jewish blood is terrifyingly cheap. It can be shed like water. And this existed on, up to now only de facto. Now the court has decreed it. And indeed, only last week, in response to an Instagram post by a TV star, Rotem Sella, Netanyahu clearly stated that Israel is not a state of all its citizens. According to the nation state law that we passed, Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people and them alone. And this completely refutes the existence of 20% of the state's citizens. Moreover, Moshe Feiglin, who was a former deputy um, speaker of the Knesset, um, and now a, an extreme right election favorite, because he uh, vowed to legalize cannabis, has published an explicit genocidal plan for the people of Gaza last week. And he writes the Israeli army should designate certain open areas in the Sinai border, adjacent to the sea, in which the civilian population will be concentrated, far from the built-up areas that are used for launches and tunneling. In these areas, tent encampments, encampments will be established until relevant emigration destinations are found. The supply of electricity and water to the formerly populated area will be disconnected and the formerly populated area will be shelled with maximum fire power. If this is not genocide, I don't know what it is. Now, talking about Israel as a settler colony, Ilan Papa has claimed that Israel is the last active settler colonial project in existence. But despite that, the Israel, Israeli settler colony is neither unique nor the last existing settler colony, as demonstrated in Wolf's uh, work, compar comparative al a analysis of settler colonialism in Australia, the US, Brazil, and Palestine. He theorizes settler colonialism, and I'm sure you know that, I'll just go through it very quickly, as a structure, not an event, and is characterized by a logic of elimination. And he argues that rather than exploiting the natives, settler colonialism destroys and dis de replaces what it destroys. This is evident 
in Zionist practices replacing depopulated Palestinian villages and urban neighborhoods with Jewish settlements, roads, and national parks, substituting our placement with Hebrew placements, replacing Palestinian orchards with imported European conifers, and the current practice of population transfers and demolishing Bedouin villages. And these are deemed unrecognized because uh, or as a result of being unrecognized, they have no uh, running water, electricity, roads, school, and any other basic services. La Papa has also said that settler colonialism is a new paradigm. But as Chaim mentioned, it's been going on for a long time. People have theorized Israel as a settler colony from the 1940s onwards. Palestinian theory satisfies Sayeg, Konstantin <coughs> um, Zurayek, Elia Zurayek, the French uh, Marxist writer Maxime Rodinson, and even Israeli sociologists such as Baruch Kimmerling and Gershon Shafir have done it in the 1980s. While colonialism focused on exploiting resources and colonized populations, settler colonials come to stay and regard the colonized ter territory as their own, as Israeli Jews do to this day. Wolf understands Settler colonialism is in terms of structured genocide, that word that nobody wants to mention, illustrating the concrete relationship between spatial removal, mass killings, and biocultural assimilation, although assimilation is something that really didn't happen in the Palestinian situation. It happened in Australia. Wolf books traces the ways in which regimes of race reflect and reproduce colonialism. He says race is a trace of history. Colonial population continue to be racialized in specific ways that mark out and reproduce the unequal relationships into which Europeans have co-opted these populations. But what's interesting is the Zionists themselves explicitly cast the Zionist project in colonial terms. The term Yishuv, which is the name of the pre-state uh, polity, actually means settlement or colony in Hebrew. Um, in the um, first Zionist Congress of 1897 that voted to, in favor of Jewish immigration to Palestine, it was explicitly decided to, to establish three types of colonies. <coughs> this is written into the, into the uh, protocol or into the minutes in Palestine. Kibbutz, a moshav, and a town. And nor is the Israeli colonization of Palestine dispute today, disputed today. For instance, Netanyahu, has, who has denied in a recent speech that Israel is occupying Palestine, has actually argued that empires have always conquered and replaced entire populations, and nobody speaks about it. Note the term empire to describe Israel. Interesting. Note, I didn't say it. However, like theories of exception, Settler colonial theory larger, largely obscures race, and Patrick Wolf's book is an exception. And it has actually been critiqued by uh, indigenous scholars as Eurocentric itself and as a decontextualized white supremacist euphemism for white supremacy, white terrorism, white invasion, and seizure. This is what the indigenous scholar Sandy O'Sullivan in Australia says. So I follow Alexander Wehlie, who critiques Agamben and Foucault for Eurocentrism and lack of attention to what Wehlie calls racialized assemblages. And he positions race front and center in consideration of political violence as sociopolitical processes of differentiation. Note, he does not speak of race as a social construct, and in fact, my daughter, Alana Lentin, uh, critiques very much the, the notion that race is merely a social construct. It's more a political construct. Now, um, these processes of differentiation are regularly employed in Israel. Though neither Israel nor most Israeli scholars see these processes as racial or even racist, but rather as a consequence of Israel's self-perception of victimhood and the need to defend itself. In recent years, more and more people have uh, used uh, uh, the reality or admitted the reality of racism. Only very few theories focus on the centrality of race and state racism. 
Neve Gordon, you know, Cohen um, article is a bit of an exception. They talk about Israel's biospatial strategies of racialization. However, what I'd like to say that theorizing racism without, define, without placing race at the heart of the analysis derives from a, a, a looking at racism as individual prejudice, exclusion, or discrimination, where racism ceases to be a concept with a specific history and a particular logic of indicting race. So all this and other things makes, for me, race an indispensable, although hitherto missing element in theorizing the Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine. But it's also interesting to, when I argue in the book, that paradoxically, for a group of people whose history is replete with racial persecution, Zionist ideology itself articulates the Jewish race, constructing homogeneous, homogeneous Jewish people with Jewish self and other racialization as integral part of the Zionist ideology. The Israeli geneticist Raphael Falk reads the history of Zionism as a eugenic race project, aiming to save the Jewish genetic pool from the degeneration of the diaspora. Now, many prominent Zionist leaders, including Theodor Herzl, Max Noda, Arthur Rupin, Rupin and others, insisted just like the Nazis, on constructing the Jews as a race. Noldark coined the term muscular Judaism to denote new Jews as masculine warriors, eh, opposing not only the Palestinians, but also their own despised diaspora past. But just as antisemitism racialized Jews as a separate race, which justified the persecution by biological reasoning, so Zionist ideologues adopted the terminology of folk, a racial nation shaped by blood and soil, and were instrumental in producing a Zionist repertoire of racial categorization and Jewish supremacy. So this is why Prime Minister Begin could say in the Knesset in 1982, a race is a master race. We are divine gods on this planet. We are as different from the inferior races as they are from insects. In fact, compared to our race, other races are beasts and animals. Other races are human excrement. Five. Our destiny to rule over the inferior races. The masses will lick our feet and serve us as our slaves. Now, as Chaim already mentioned, race in Israel is not constructed only in terms of the Palestinians, also in relation to Arab Jews and non-Jewish, non-white refugees. Interestingly, in Last year, a Pew Research Institute poll found that 57% of Israeli Jews were against accepting refugees, more than any other country that participated in that survey. Now, I end the book with a chapter on decolonization, which Chaim didn't mention, and contrary to the legal scholar, Palestinian legal scholar Rives Rake, who argues that decolonization of Palestine entails the duty of the colonized to offer a solution to the settlers as well as the colonized, I concur with Fanon's theory of decolonization as a program of total disorder. Not in the sense of chaos, but rather, as Stephen Salaita writes, in the sense of the total rejection of colonial rule and an act of removal or removing order from the structures of foreign authority. So I'll conclude briefly. Writing about victims of oppression is considered more morally edifying than writing about the perpetrators. However, I, as a Palestinian-born Israeli Jewish scholar and activist, devoted most of my life and academic career to researching the perpetrator of Israel's war against the Palestinians. This book is a re result of life, a lifelong commitment to Palestinian freedom and the lifelong, often agonizing reflection on my privileged position as a white Ashkenazi Jewish member of Israel's settler colonial perpetrator collectivity. What a mouthful. <laughs> my parents were settler immigrants from Romania, and several members of their family had died in the ghettos of Transnistria, where they were sent by the Romanians and the Nazis. <coughs> They thought of us, their children, as the first generation to redemption from anti-Semitism in what they fantasized was their promised land. I studied in one of Israel's uh, 
elite private schools where education was Persian in style and military in spirit or the other way around. And we were indoctrinated with a little mi mixture of victimhood and white Jewish supremacy. We were told that Jewish people, those superior, were, are, and would always be victims of anti-Semitism. That the whole world is against us and that no one helped the Jews during the Holocaust, which was the worst crime in the history of humanity and the only genocide that matters, regardless of colonialism, slavery, and the extermination of so many indigenous peoples. Israel, they told us, is a haven for the entire Jewish nation. And it's justified in defending itself by whatever mean. I'm inspired by what Robin DiAngelo writes about whiteness, and I exchange whiteness with Jewishness, so you see what I mean here. I can speak as an insider to my socialization into Jewishness, the messages of superiority I've received, patterns I have developed, advantages I enjoy, and the personal and institutional challenges I face when seeking to counter racism. I'm not, in fact, innocent of race. Only in my early 20s, after the 67 war, did I actually realize we were lied to and that Israel was an imperialist settler colonial project in a land already populated by another people whose design is expelled and whose lands and properties we stole. As a lifelong pro-Palestine activist, I've written obsessively about Israel's war against the Palestinians in the face of family rifts and community opprobrium. However, it's taken until now for me to combine my academic work on race and racism in other contexts with my work on Palestine and Israel to reach, reach this junction in this book. And this I'd like to put to you, I suppose, is the nature of passion. Thank you very much.